great that you could join us and take time out for this interesting discussion, Thomas. We had a Thanks very a interesting discussion at Nordic Startup Festival a couple of weeks ago, but this will be deeper into plug and play. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Thanks again for uh, the invitation and for last time as well. Honestly, uh, the Nordic Startup Festival was, was amazing. I'm really competitive. <laughs> I can only recommend and more than happy to uh, evaluate further the next event you are going to organize. Brilliant, year, uh, brilliant. We'll we, we'll talk about uh, that. I think because we'll need we'll be needing we we have a lot of pitch requests, so we need to have some uh, VCs and ecosystem players ready with us to make a, a deal flow and take them to the next destination. But let's start today's discussion, and if we could um, if we could start with you, Thomas, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, of so course. that audience can know about you. Of course. Hello, everyone. I'm Thomas Bigali. I'm French, Italian. I, mean, I grew up in France, as you can hear. I have quite a strong accent, right? I started living abroad when I was 18, while I was, um, you know, studying in business schools. And then uh, I started working abroad. I started, uh, you know, working the tech ecosystem roughly seven years ago. I've done a bunch of things, but uh, I started then working at Plug and Play four years ago, first in the Valley, where we have our HQ. But then in Berlin, where I was supporting the launch of a bunch of uh, offices, and then I decided to go back where I come from, to Paris, to launch another office myself with two colleagues. Um, it was at Station F, you know, in 2019, I think, so pretty uh, a big hype around this space, as you know. And from there, we actually uh, opened even more offices. So I had the chance to contribute to the launch of uh, roughly 10 offices of, out of the 50 that we have. And since, uh, since last year, I'm director now of uh, investments in Europe, in Europe, Middle East, and, and Africa. Uh, you know, plug and play, we do a bunch of things. We are the largest open innovation platform on one side, but also one of the most active early stage uh, investor. Awesome, awesome. So a lot of travel involved, 10 offices, that's huge. And uh, EMEA region is very active in so many spaces right now. There's no so much innovation and commercial activity happening. So great to have you in the epicenter or the center of all this activity, Thomas. Um, I'd like to know uh, here, like what attracted you to the startup space itself? Well, frankly speaking, it's a lifelong passion for, uh, for innovation. Since I'm young, I'm, I was always trying to uh, think about how I could make a product or a service better. You okay. know, myself, even as a kid, I was drawing like how I could uh, reinvent the next umbrella, for instance, so that you don't need to, to carry it anymore. Stuff like that. So, and I was lucky enough to be born in this generation where tech has been growing uh, a lot since the 90s. And I started realizing the, you know, the importance of uh, technology when it comes to entrepreneurship and how far you can go in quite a short um, timeline and started digging a bit more into it. And when I was studying, I participated to a lot of contests, then you know, created some ventures, some were failures, some a bit less, as you can imagine, but learned along the way and uh, started supporting startup. And while I was doing an exchange um, at Stanford University, I had a chance to visit the HQ of Plug and Play. And back then I was doing a, a innovation contest for LVMH. And uh, I asked Plug and Play to connect me to the brand new uh, brand and retail office in Paris, because mm -hmm. I thought they could uh, actually mentor me in this uh, innovation uh, project. But actually, no, they, they thought I wanted a job <laughs> while I was still studying. So, you know, I was not seeking for a job yet. And uh, I wanted to launch my own ventures originally after studying. But I loved so much the vibe of uh, Plug and Play, the fact that we are not on your VC, you know, mm. and we are not, uh, we are working, you know, close to all of the stakeholders of the value chain of innovation. And I thought this was a, an amazing opportunity uh, to tap in uh, uh, this, uh, this amazing uh, innovation sphere. And uh, then I applied uh, the summer after and started working there. Now it's been four years already. Time flies. Time flies, yes. But, but I think very interesting background. You talked about uh, reinventing your interest and passion in reinventing and doing new things. And then you plugged in that tech was like, tech is ripe for this generation. So I think I, I completely agree with you. And then you got involved in studies, started venture creation, innovation contests, and it finally plug, uh, plug and play. Wow, what a journey. 
if we come to plug and play, uh, let's let's try to understand because you guys are doing a lot of stuff. So can we define like what are you, who are you as plug and play? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Maybe uh, you know to tell you a bit more about what we are doing. I will start with the story because it's quite inspiring. Mm -hmm. But for um, all of you guys that are not aware of that, plug and play is actually a family business. Mm -hmm. So we are owned by uh, our CEO and founder called Saeed Amidi. Um, he's a really inspiring person that left uh, Iran during the revolution and moved to the to California. And originally, he was not that much into tech. You know, he was more in supply chain, in industrial businesses, etc. But he acquired the building uh, in University Avenue, which is located basically in front of Stanford uh, University. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened? is that he, uh, when he saw the property prices, you know, increasing a lot during the dot-com bubble and all of these tech entrepreneurs that back then were not called really uh, uh, startupers, right? Um, launching their new ventures in their garage, he was like, maybe there is an opportunity there. So he transformed his building into the first startup campus. So basically the equivalent of Station F, right? But back in the 90s. And he was lucky enough to uh, have as first tenant, Sergey and Larry, that uh, co-launched Google. Then uh, Peter Thiel, that launched PayPal. Pierluigi mm -hmm. Dapacosa with Logitech and et cetera. And so, of course, he saw an opportunity in investing in, this, uh, in these startups. And from there, he started his you know, VC, let's say, or business angel back then, uh, activities, plus nurturing this ecosystem. Okay. And when he had his first return on investment, in 2006, he bought uh, the old HQ of Philip Electronics, that is actually still our HQ, in uh, in Sunnyvale. Um, you know, to grow his ambition, be able to host even more startups, etc. Invite investors, mentors, create an even bigger ecosystem. And a bit after, he had a great, another great idea, was to support large corporations that were struggling with innovation to use external technologies of all of these, uh, you know, really inspiring and innovative uh, startups to help the, the dinosaur, let's say, try mm -hmm. to move along the way. And uh, so far we've been, you know, expanding. We have more than 50 offices now, all the way to Tokyo, Japan on five continents. And we are supporting more than 600 large corporations. So, you know, to sum up all of this story, uh, we've been growing a lot. Uh, we are still a VC, one of the most uh, active ones. We have uh, 35 uh, unicorns uh, in our portfolio. And we are supporting these large corporations to boost their digital transformations using startups. And this is what we call accelerating a startup. So our definition is, is not really the, the definition you may see in other players in this industry. We are actually totally free of charge and equity for the startups, right? We uh, scout them connect them and facilitate their collaboration until the implementation between large corporations and startups. Okay, I'm very interested in knowing about, uh, about the large corporation because in Sweden, for example, uh, there's a lot of work happening individually in organization for corporate innovation. And what I've seen recently is there are many ecosystem players who have been active in VC space or accelerators, they have started joining in, going in Ericsson's and other companies and building their own internal acceleration booths where they kind of accelerate, ABB is there. So the kind of, the, so it's because big corporations are very big, so they need the agility. So as an elephant, they need the agility of an ant, for example. And that's why they try to learn the startup culture. So that's happening very individually here. Uh, while you guys are doing it more as a collective, you said a number, what was it, 600 plus? 600 plus, yeah. So, so how, what's your model? I'm very interested in knowing, like, uh, how are you engaging with them? Do you have a cluster of corporations and they, then they throw challenges to you? How does that happen? That's a really, really good question. And thanks for mentioning uh, Ericsson and ABB because they are actually partner of ours. And okay. uh, as you know, we will be opening uh, soon some uh, Nordic offices with mm -hmm. few of my colleagues who are working really hard on that and, and they will be uh, our partners there. So really exciting stuff. But to, to go back to your point, it's a really interesting question because back in the, back in the day, plug and play was mostly 
you know, scout, um, you know, sitting with the innovation team of large corporations or business units directly mm -hmm. and help them to identify their key uh, challenges and, and prioritize them so that we could scout the best startups. And, you know, we, we started individually, but then created some, let's say, clusters. And we saw that the, the, in the innovation uh, scene, large corporations that are even competitors are really willing to share knowledge you know, and, and potentially to collaborate together. And I can give you thousands of, uh, of examples of that. And so what we've been doing at Play and Play is that in any case, all of our partnerships are tailor-made. We have some services that, that are more, let's say, renowned than some others, such as the, the one I was mentioning to you, the identifying problems, scouting, uh, uh, facilitating uh, projects, et cetera. But at the end of the day, what we try to nurture on top of that is this ecosystem. And this ecosystem is actually not only made of startups and corporations. Plug and Play is really at the middle of a wall, uh, a chain of different players. Can be governments, can be mentors, can be investors, research centers, et cetera. And large corporations, again, are really willing to collaborate with all of these uh, different players because they know that uh, in order to innovate, they cannot do uh, everything in-house. And how uh, plug and play is helping them to be more agile is by setting up a, a structure where internally, where they can actually uh, move quite fast in comparison to what they, they will do by themselves, right? So we, I can give you some examples, but basically mm -hmm. we, tend to, we tend to have the buy-in of uh, the C-suite always when we assign a, a, a partnership. But our main point of contact will be the innovation team. And the innovation team will act in a way as a bridge between the priorities and the vision of the C-suite, but also the key challenges of all of the different business units. And plug and play is an extension arm, let's say, of this innovation team, where they can rely on all of our ecosystem and expertise. Okay. And, and, and then what role does geography play or is there like for example if we take abb ericsson or let's say there are some swedish corporations uh, does it need to be a connection between them and the swedish ecosystem based startups how does that actually work really good question as well it's uh, we we can tell the audience we actually did not prepare guys the questions but the, the, <laughs> they are they are really uh, well asked um, now, to, to answer this point, it's a really good point, because at the end of the day, when we work with a, a corporate partner, sometimes we work at a group level, uh, sometimes at a geographical level, and sometimes as a department level. Mm -hmm. so, so it depends a lot, and you, you won't be able to see that, um, except if you work at Plug and Play, right? But uh, we do work with a lot of Swedish corporate partners since mm -hmm. decades in other geographical zones. And now we see that first, you know, the Nordics are, uh, when it comes to innovation, you are a pioneer and we, you, you, you are really experts and we know uh, that it will make a lot of sense for us to, to enter this market. But on top of that, we think we will be closer to, the, to their HQ. And we've seen, um, you know, in the past that our most successful partnerships have been the one that are close to the HQ. Um, but we've been working with Ericsson with their lab in the Silicon Valley for I don't know, like maybe eight years. Uh, ABB, we just started partnership with them in Switzerland. Uh, we are working with Tetra Pak in Italy. And why in Italy is because they, are, they have some of their factories and research centers there. So it makes a lot of sense when it comes to innovation as well, right? Okay. So, you know, to answer your question, again, it's really a case by case. Um, okay. But we tend to prefer, frankly speaking, uh, to work, you know, with these large corporations near the HQ because we know we can have you know, bigger impact. Um, just to give you an example, when we launched like the BNP Paribas uh, program, the FinTech program in Paris, mm -hmm. or a startup autobahn in Stuttgart with Daimler, we actually have done that with the C-suite. And this okay. is why it became so successful. Like our, the, the previous uh, startup autobahn expo was on July 7th this okay. summer. We actually had the, the CEO of Daimler that came to uh, do the opening remark, you know? While if Daimler was a partner of ours only in the Silicon Valley, this would be a bit more complicated, as you can imagine. So to have a bigger impact, always mm -hmm. closer to the HQ, I would say. But when it comes to the work we will do, you know, we can scout startups anywhere. Uh, it depends on the criteria that they want. Criteria may be 
uh, related to the to it can be technology related can be maturity related okay. or geographically related we have some corporate partners that they want us for a specific um you know pain points to scout only a trl mm. five plus so quite late stage companies outside of their own country for instance it's just an example but they can give us these criteria so that we can narrow down when we scout great great so so beyond startups and corporations let's say are there any other interactions you have in ecosystem or do you primarily stick to these two play, uh, players really good question i mean um generally speaking the the, the, the large corporations are the one paying us so we work mm -hmm. with them quite quite a lot actually out of the 600 not all of them are large corporations i would say maybe 90 percent okay 10 other percent maybe some uh, government or big research centers etc right okay uh, so we and we have more and more of these partnerships actually you would be really surprised uh, especially in the emerging markets mm -hmm. when it comes to um, the rest of the ecosystem so mentors for instance we we tend to engage them a lot when it comes to uh, to, to supporting our, of network of entrepreneurs okay. the investors we work with them on a daily basis because we are sharing a lot of deal flow as you can imagine no, we invest in 200 startups per annum. So we 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 do analyze quite a bunch. <laughs> okay. Then when it comes to uh, research centers or governments that are paying us or not paying us, we do work with them because you know they they they, they work closely with the large corporations as well. So it makes sense um, when we work on some deep tech projects, for instance, or super capital intensive uh, projects to get closer to them as well. But when we organize events or try to nurture the overall ecosystem, we will invite all of them. If we do like a horizontal event, events, yeah, we will invite all of them. Sometimes our events are a bit more specialized, you know, like I'm organizing a super cool uh, VC mixer in Paris on okay. Tuesday. It's only for tech investors, right? <laughs> okay, that's nice to know. And um, let's come to, because uh, you said that at the core, you have continued to be a VC in some way. Tell me a little bit about that. What does that mean? Is it that you have your own VC arm or do you connect other VCs when you are going into startups? You said a deal for, of, let's say, 200 plus. How, how usually are those relationships managed? Is it your internal VC that goes in or can you or do you enable connections? Really good point. Actually, to 200 is, is investment per annum. And I think this year we should reach even more because with okay. the new uh, EMEA IC, we've been investing in 70 since February. So I guess, uh, wow. yeah, we should reach at least 300 investment this year. Um, to answer your point, we've been started, you know, plug and play, where we started investing through the family office directly in pre seed and seed startups. Uh, we increased drastically our number of investment of over 150 or 200 startups per annum since okay. like five years and since two years we've been creating uh, thematic funds with some corporations as lps to okay. invest in later stage companies because you know like most of the vc funds in any way that are quite big and renowned they want to cover the 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 the, the world uh, i mean the, the more stage you can cover the better it is because uh, the access to deal is, is quite competitive nowadays right so if you are a pre seed seed investor then you raise you know later stage investment vehicles so that you can do your pro and follow on and also uh, invest in miss uh, opportunities so plug and play overall we are investing from uh, pre seed to series a plus so we cover quite a lot but we are a strategic investor, so we do not lead rounds. Our ticket size, uh, they range from 50K to 500K. Okay. And we co-invest with lead investors. Why, why startups like having plug and play in, on, on their cap table is simply because our portfolio promises are huge, right? We are more than a VC. We have a huge ecosystem. We are 800 employees, 50 offices. I mean, I, I cannot even... Uh, uh, tell all of our added value in, in just one minute, but it's quite big for them and really important. When it comes to uh, other opportunities where we are not investing in, we have a lot as well. And why it, it may be confusing is because our VC activities and our startup acceleration activities are totally disconnected. Okay. When we invest in a startup, um, 
you know, again, we tend to prefer investing in B2B software ones. We can do B2C, actually. We have a bunch of B2C uh, uh, unicorns, but still, you know, generally speaking, we tend to invest in, uh, in software's B2B startups. While the startups will be accelerating through our corporate innovation uh, activities, as you can imagine, you have also a lot of uh, hardware solutions. But it's not because we have them that we will actually invest in them. Some of them are actually Series B, you know, so it's not at all our scope. So you, uh, I would like the, the, the people that are that dial in today to, to understand that, you know, this acceleration and VC activities are totally uh, disconnected. Of course, sometimes they are overlapping and we can be opportunistic, but not necessarily. And another thing that is important is that our corporate partners, another innovation service that we uh, you know, created lately, and that is booming. You know, mm -hmm. we have a lot of inbound. Is CVC as a service? Okay. So on top of you know having some corporate partners investing in our, in our new funds, we have the uh, Walmart and Walmart Family they invest in our supply chain logistic fund. We have PVH, our brand and retail, etc. But on the other side, we also have large corporations that are paying us to outsource all of their you know CVC investment process, except the decision. So we do the scouting, we can help them train their teams, we can help them to define their investment thesis. Uh, we will uh, screen the startups, do the due, dilig due diligences, legal businesses, etc. But it will be up to them to invest and to, to, to take the decision. And why it's so important is because we don't want to, uh, you know, to be biased. We okay. want to give honest feedback, but you know, CVCs, they are investing uh, in uh, mostly strategic startups, not necessarily for return investment. So uh, for us, it's more, uh, the, what matters the most is to do our job and to, to provide like qualitative feedback on if, if, is it worth it to invest in this startup or not? But plug and play won't necessarily jump in as well because you know it's not our scope. Got it. So, so uh, as I understand, maybe I'm wrong here, uh, but generally on the corporate side, when a corporate takes initiatives, then you go out and look for specific type of startups, right? That's one way of, exactly. of being connected to startups. But on the other hand, you also get a lot of general startup deal flow through your web and other channels. Is, is it two separate flows that are happening? Yeah, that, that's a really good point as well. So, you know, we have a huge ventures team at Plug and Play. Mm -hmm. And they do not only scout for investment opportunities. They also scout for, you know, the, the, the tech focuses, pain points of our large corporations. Okay. Um, when it comes to how we scout, we have different ways. So first, we have our team that is proactively scouting on, okay. you know, on a daily basis for uh, interesting startups. But we also, you know, uh, organize a lot of events and we are sponsoring a lot of events. Uh, you know, like Slush or, or, or the Web Summit, Viva Tech, et cetera. Uh, we also do, you know, speak a lot, as I mentioned before, with uh, the rest of the ecosystem, tech uh, VC, uh, uh, tech investors ecosystem, so business angels and VCs. And we are sharing a lot of deal flows with them. So they provide some deal flow to us as well. Okay. Um, and this is really, really important for us too, right? Because, uh, I mean, in this sphere, Honestly, like uh, tech investors, they are actually uh, collaborating more than competing uh, most of the time. Of course, some that get exactly the same investment thesis uh, might fight sometimes for some deals. But what mm -hmm. matters is to find other funds with which you are complementary and share a bunch okay. of deal flow. Got it. Got it. You've mentioned events a few times. Like, um, I would like to know a little bit more detail about that. Like, when you're talking about events, is it that you are doing your own events or are you going to certain events like Tech Barbecue or Slash or how does that work? Mm. We actually uh, organize over a thousand events per annum. Okay. The, the size, uh, you know, may vary, right? So we, we are organizing some events with more than 3,000 people and some with 200, right? So okay. it, it depends a lot on the geography, the, 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 the geographical location, uh, the type of events we, we want, is it uh, public, private, and private, mm -hmm. etc. Um, the purpose of these events may be different as well. You know, it can range from a, a VC mixer all the way to the expo to promote like what the large corporations and the startups have been working on for the past six months, for instance. So honestly, 
they are all really different. Um, and you can find them on our, on our website. And frankly speaking, like the, the, the quality of the content and the speaker is pre pretty high up. So I would definitely mm -hmm. recommend uh, anyone online today to, to check that out. Um, but when it comes to external events, we actually do sponsor some, participate, mm -hmm. and collaborate with a bunch of them. Uh, for instance, we have a partnership with the Web Summit soon, where we'll do a, an event aside, uh, you know, play and play event aside. And, uh, and uh, for us, it gives us a lot of visibility. And for them, it's good to rely also on the network of, uh, of, uh, of play and play. Uh, same with Slush. We've done the same with VivaTech. Uh, we are doing the same with uh, the CES. Sometimes we have booths, like the CES. Most of the years, we had the booths as well. Uh, but some other times not. We organize counter event or just sponsors and and try to uh, to collaborate with uh, with all of these uh, great event companies that are that are happening. Because frankly speaking, in in the world, you have really great uh, uh, tech events companies, and we tend to collaborate with them because we've seen that there is a lot of synergies between our activities. Got it. Got it. So it seems that there is so much happening at Plug and Play. I'm just trying to form some structure around it. Uh, how, how do you guys like, is it like, how, how are you organized? Is it that you operate as a fluid team? Like, how does that work? Like there's thousand events, 200 plus startups as a deal flow, which you said that this year could, that's a lot of work, 600 plus corporate. So how do you keep focus as an organization? <laughs> yeah, good one, uh, really good one. We, we, we do work hard. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> We do work hard, but I, I would say how we are split. So uh, mm -hmm. first and foremost, we are a global company. You know? Even mm -hmm. though we have uh, some uh, so a bunch of offices in, in, in different continents, we will always collaborate with the other offices. Mm -hmm. you know? Always, always, always. Because uh, you, you have a lot of overlaps when it comes to one uh, industry to another, and we can learn from the, the different offices. And uh, all of the, the different services, again, uh, the, partner the partnerships they have may be really different mm -hmm. uh, as they are all tailor-made, but still we can learn from what they've been doing. Um, if they have been innovating, if they have been creating new innovation services, this, uh, you know, successes we can rep uh, replicate in other locations. When it comes to the core team, I would say of plug and play, what you need, you know, the, the, the bare minimum to launch something. Uh, we tend to have always someone in, in, in ventures. So that's mm -hmm. the tech experts, right? The person that will deal with the, the, the startup. So he needs to understand the, the trends, benchmarks, uh, scouts on a daily basis uh, for the corporations, but also for investments, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to, uh, you know, the, the partnerships that we have, we have goals that we call partner success that are taking care of our uh, corporate partners, making sure we understood uh, well, their, their pain points, their tech focuses, uh, et cetera. And lastly, we have the operational team that is the one that will uh, make sure everything is running smoothly, do the mm -hmm. project uh, management when it comes to the POC, you know, to make sure it's, uh, it, uh, it may lead to great success and get uh, industrialized later on. But also it's, um, the, the operational guy will be the, 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 the person that will organize the events. Uh, with the help of the, the partner success and the ventures, of course, but but still. So I would say, you know, to create an office, a plug and play, this is the bare minimum you need. And then you may have a director on top that mm -hmm. oversees mm -hmm. the, the tree. Uh, but these three roles are the prerequisite uh, for us to make sure a collaboration with uh, a, co a corporation will run smoothly. Awesome. Awesome. Very interesting. Um let's uh, for the last part of our discussion let's go to the startup side a little bit so so imagine i'm a startup in sweden i have uh, uh, i have a prototype ready maybe i have some initial customer traction uh, in let's say x industry i'm not defining an industry yet because you are in several uh, verticals I, I was reading at your website 15 plus or something verticals so What's, what does my journey look like with plug and play? Where do I start? Because you have several offerings. You said accelerator is separate, VC is separate. You can connect startups with corporate innovations or, or CBC requests may be coming in like, okay, so I'm confused. So I want <laughs> to understand a little bit, like how do you make my life simple? As a startup, what do I do? Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. 
And first, maybe before answering these questions, uh, I will just um, uh, tell you something on the verticals that we have. Yeah. We, we, have uh, we have over 20 verticals, but what it's really important to mention is that, you know, all of our large corporations that are part of this vertical are not, they, they, they can ask us to work on some projects from different industries as well. Mm -hmm. A good example would be Daimler, you know, it's part of the mobility vertical, but their pain points may be related to energy, sustainability, new materials, whatever, right? So we people need to see the verticals of plug and play more like knowledge and networking clusters mm -hmm. rather than limitation of, of uh, scope of work. Um, mm -hmm. But to answer your, your point on, a, on, on how we are supporting startups, yeah. Um, when it comes to the investment side, so, you know, if you manage to, to make it and we are investing in your company, we will, uh, of course, make sure uh, we will provide uh, all of the all of great uh, added value and help you to, to strive. Uh, I think plug and play is, you know, really, I mean, the added value of portfolio promises of plug and play when it comes to see, uh, at the seed stage, so the value of this, they are key. Because we are supporting startups, we are giving them a lot of visibility through events. Mm -hmm. uh, we can connect them to uh, some of their future customers that are, you know, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, we can help them to expand to new geographical zones, mm -hmm. enter new industries, raise further rounds with tier one VCs, right? So, you know, it's quite it's quite a bunch of uh, of super strong added value that are required. And I would say that plug and play is quite well placed uh, when it comes to supporting portfolio startups. Now, when it comes to accelerated startups, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. these startups are entering. Uh, so you have two ways. You can be part of a program. Okay. The programs that are happening uh, twice per annum and they are, um, you know, fixed terms, timeline. You know that uh, during three months or six months, you will work with these corporations on one project. And at the end of this uh, uh, timeline, you will have the expo when, where you will be showcasing all of the results of your product, blah, blah, blah. Right? So that's a really good way to enter plug and play ecosystem. So we can reach out to you because we have been scouting you uh, okay. and you've been uh, pre-selected, let's say pre-qualified by plug and play. And we want to uh, have further discussions to see if you can really answer the needs of our corporate partners. Then if you manage to, to answer well all of these questions and be the right fit, we will uh, send, I mean, put you in our top list and share this list with our corporation. And our corporations will then select the ones they would like to meet. And we organize what we call a deal flow session or a selection there, right? And during this, uh, this event, they will be able to, uh, you know, challenge the startups, learn, learn more, ask questions. And the goal after this event, of course, to, of course, to pick the ones uh, with uh, which they would like to start a, a, a pilot project that we will support and facilitate. So when it comes to acceleration, mm -hmm. plug and play, what we do is we are pre-qualifying you, amazing meetings with the right people because the, I mean, if we if we are inviting you to a deal flow or a selection there, it means that plug and play plus our partners. I've been shortlisting you. Okay. And after uh, you know your pitch and answering the, the the questions, if you are not selected, is because they found another startups that could be a, a better fit. And then we are doing that again free of charge and equity, so it's pretty it's pretty good for the startup. Well, an extension of their BD uh, arm, you know. Great, great. So, so two points over here. First, you said that you have a very strong. It seems, because you have mentioned it several times in your uh, conversation, scouting, the word scouting, which seems that uh, generally your model is that you get a challenge or you have good enough sense of the market to actually pick up the prime startups from the market. Is that the primary model that it works? Or is it like any VC, for example, that they get thousands of pitches and then you are going through pitches and then selecting? Like, what is the main model? Uh, it's a it's a very good question as well. You know, in bond applications, we uh, we we tend not to select that many. Uh, frankly mm -hmm. speaking, uh, I, I guess what works the best for model is proactive uh, scouting. And yes, we have uh, our venture teams. They are you know experts in, in in their respective markets, and they know what's happening. They know which startups is good 
or not for this specific use case, etc. But again, there is something else to mention is the, 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 the criteria, the additional criteria that the large corporation may, may ask us. So sometimes they can be, again, like technological or geographical or maturity criteria. Some large corporations might, they, they may ask us to scout only locally or only internationally, early stage or late stage, it depends. So this may, uh, you know, shift a bit the type of startups we uh, we will scout to answer their needs and for um, investment opportunities we scout again proactively just the criteria are different for us because we want uh, we're investing mostly in early stage and we want um, highly scalable startups right okay these great teams with uh, at the time uh, uh, you know a big market uh, that is uh, that is out at the moment etc but I would say the, the scouting for uh, the startups that we will be sending to our corporate partners and the one for investment that mm -hmm. are really different. The skills that you require you as someone that will scout mm -hmm. are the same, but just the criteria are really different. Okay. Got it. Um, two questions. Uh, let me see which one to take. Because uh, initially you said that you your ticket size for going into startups is around 50K to 500K. What are the terms? Like what are the expectations on the startup? Uh, do you, I'm just trying to clarify for our uh, audience here, is it that you take a stake in the startups? Is it a minimum commitment that you need from them? A presence at a location, some sort of a contract? How does that work? No, actually, we, we, we work exactly like VC. So okay. we, we plug ourselves to the uh, valuation of the lead investor because, again, we are strategic investor, right? So we are not okay. fixing the terms. We may be negotiating the terms like NVC, okay. but uh, we plug ourselves to the, to the valuation uh, that, in our opinion, is, is fair uh, for that round. When it comes to the ticket size, of course, I mean, uh, smaller the ticket size, earlier is the maturity of the startup generally. Mm -hmm. you know? So pre-seed, we put like 50K to 100K. Seed, we will put like, I don't know, 80K to 200K. Series A, 200K to 500K, roughly. You know? okay. So case by case, but <laughs> but roughly, yeah, is, uh, is the way we invest. And again, you know, family office, pre-seed, seed, and the thematic funds with corporate LPs for Series A+. plus um generally and we invest we are totally industry agnostic we invest in every uh, geographical zones um we mostly invest in b2b and software companies mm -hmm. we have amazing successes in b2c and hardware we tend to not to invest although um you know our biggest uh, success story in the, in the nordics you know portfolio is actually a type of hardware uh, company because it's uh, Angride, which is uh, electric okay. uh, freight, you know? So yeah. pretty interesting. We do I, such investments sometimes. Okay, but when in Angride, you were, you were not the lead investor. So like we you're the usually... first investor, uh, okay. first early stage investor, first round. No, we are not leading, never. Okay. We are always a strategic, you know, a strategic investor. Okay. Uh, now, so, so great to know, I think uh, you gave very interesting uh, ranges here. Uh, we have a question. Let's take that before we move to my question. Thomas, is plug and play going to have an office or partners in Sweden anytime soon? Sarah has that question. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, that's the plan. I was actually in Sweden a, a year ago. This is what I, uh, I told uh, Nemo last time at the Nordic Startup Festival. Uh, it's quite funny. Nice coincidence. <laughs> Uh, we 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 will uh, really soon, and not only in Sweden. Actually, I'm working really hard with uh, some other colleagues at Plug and Play, uh, mm -hmm. Salah, Xenia, and and Jacob. Um, I think Salah was online uh, before, actually, and uh, and we should open also in Finland, so in Helsinki, in Copenhagen, and in Bergen. And we do have Nordic corporate partners already, but they've been serviced until now in other geographical zones. So we are working with Volvo, we are working with ABB, with Tetra Pak, uh, we are working with, uh, with Ericsson, etc. Okay, excellent. Sarah, yeah, great. So that answers it. Hi, Sarah. Yes, thank you. Great to see you here. 
good that you got your answer. And it's great to know that you you guys are formally moving into in a big scale over here. So you were mentioning several countries. Uh, Hamid, I see, has a pro uh, question over here. Let's see. What is the best way to reach out to plug and place team for joining the ecosystem as startup? I would say LinkedIn is a great one or joining some of our events, you know, we're organizing I mean, I don't know where you are located, uh, Hamed, but uh, we're organizing a bunch of events where we have our, our offices, of course, but sometimes in other locations where we, we will uh, open an office soon. Uh, so I will definitely, I think, to, you know, in the innovation uh, scene, generally speaking, you need to, 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 to go outside and speak with people and be really mm -hmm. proactive. So I would recommend you to try to meet some of us in person. And, uh, you know, we are super approachable. We work in innovation. We are nice. We are the middle of the ecosystem. And if we can help, uh, we will do. If it start, uh, I mean, what could be a good start is to add you to in our database, you know, so that the plug and play team globally okay. have some visibility, right, on, the, on your startup. But otherwise, uh, again, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or join some of our events. I think as a start, this is the, the best way. Great. Uh, I'm just branching in. We have the pitch event on 7th uh, December. Uh, Thomas, maybe we can collaborate with Plug and Play in some way. That could be okay. interesting because that's also Nordic focused and we all already started receiving a lot of pitches there. Um, Karin is saying you could fit well in Gothenburg. Yes, as Sweden expands, that could be a plan. Uh, but you are planning to visit Stockholm. When are you, or are you, have you already visited? No, I'm coming uh, actually in two weeks. But uh, it's funny you mentioned Gothenburg because uh, at the Startup Autobahn Expo in Stuttgart on July 7th, mm -hmm. uh, I was meeting the delegation of Gothenburg that uh, came to visit us, uh, me and my, my colleagues uh, Salah and Jacob that I mentioned before. Okay. So we are in discussions with Gothenburg as well, actually. Could be, uh, could be really interesting, definitely. Okay, great. Maria has a question. Uh, Hamid, I hope you got the response. Hamid uh, uh, is interest, is uh, involved in a lot of interesting startups, uh, I know. So I think it'll be a good connect for plug and play. Uh, Maria, you're saying, what advice do you give to someone who is an engineer in tech but wants to pivot as VC in tech? Okay. I mean, uh, it's really good to be an engineer, frankly speaking. It's, it's, it's easier to catch up on the business side than the other way around, you know? And you have a lot of VCs that, are, that, that, that like having a technical people in their team um, to be able to analyze such, uh, you know, technical startups because business people, we can't. <laughs> we uh, do some reference calls and ask uh, our engineers' friends mm -hmm. <laughs> or, you know, some of their clients directly. But um, so, so I think it's good, actually. I see that as a great skill and it's an opportunity for you. And the same for people that have been, uh, you know, launching ventures before. And even though, even if your ventures failed, uh, you have a lot of VCs, like Partek in France, one of the top uh, VC firm. Mm -hmm. They require people to have at least one entrepreneurial experience. Even if it's a failure, you know, you, you still learn. You, you can put yourself in the shoes of an entrepreneur. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's a great point. Uh, Thomas, uh, so guys, if you have questions, uh, please keep writing. I'll ask in, in the meantime, I'll ask my last question here. Thomas, any, uh, so you said for startups to reach you, of course, there's a plug and play platform and I've also put your LinkedIn link over here. So if somebody wants to connect with you, they can. And I've also put some of the upcoming events links over here. Um, but as a startup, what would be your, because you have been, you have been passionate about innovation yourself, competitions and all that, and now with plug and play four years and all. What do you think kind of makes startup rise above the others? What is that defines, uh, like if you are an investor or an innovation player and you are scouting for startups, what would you see? Okay, that one I'll go after. Yeah. Yeah, you have so many uh, different criteria. You know, you have uh, what we call the, the 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 green light, the orange light, and the red light, or red okay. flags, right? And uh, we we tend to you know see different criteria and and rank rank them and comment them a bit, a bit like consultant, you know. And we arrive and we are like, okay, so there is the, the the problem, there is the solution, there is how they solve this problem 
with their specific solution with the right fit is well well done then there is the market the market opportunity the other players how you differentiate yourself so the unique value proposition you have the bias to entry you have your tractions you have so many things to take into account. your team you know the funding team are they complementary blah 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 and when you have all of these uh, different things you need to do uh, your own research you need to call some experts in their respecting fields mm -hmm. and then you can rank them in a way and you will see the startups that are actually standing out sometimes on paper you may think that a startup you know could be amazing and then they actually do not manage to do uh, to to raise post uh, seed or series a mm -hmm. right and some other ones where you were not so sure uh, is killing it it's you need to take into account that you know the vc game is quite a, it's quite high risk this is why the return are so huge mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but frankly speaking the, the our role is to de-risk and okay. the the way we de-risk um varies a lot from one stage to another when you okay. um when you analyze a pre-seed startup is not at all the same as when you analyze series a true true there is a is far more on metrics etc right this pre-seed is is far more opportunistic on uh on the team, the market opportunity, like uh, what's popping in the market mm -hmm. at the moment is hot. What are the trends? Uh, are they disruptive or not, etc. Right. So I would say, for to answer your question, um, we just have a set of criteria that we tend okay. to check, and we need to do our due diligence on all of these different criteria, and we rank them. And uh, our, our our goal is really to the risk as much as we can. Brilliant. I think that's, that's a very comprehensive answer. And thank you for uh, sharing those insights. We can take one more questions and then we can round off the discussion. I was wondering what, uh, okay, so Ellie has a question. I was wondering what will make a VC feel fear of missing out? So, okay, but this the fear of missing out so <laughs> many, uh, you, you can't imagine how many times I had the fear of missing out. Um, <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, when you have a really a disruptive uh, startup is great. So in my opinion, having a great idea is not that hard, you know, like for, for some people it may be, but I think the, the hardest is actually to cobble this project so that you answer, you know, in a, in a, in a really good way, the needs of your potential customers mm. at the beginning. And then it's how you will execute to gain traction quickly and survive and, and grow. Right. So, you know, the life of a startup is, is quite, uh, it's not that easy and it's quite risky and you need to work really hard, to do a thousand stuff. Uh, so yeah, you, you, you know, it's right. And mm. the thing is, as soon as you have a great team of entrepreneurs that are launching a really disruptive project that is booming, you can be sure that some other people in the same market and outside of this market will do the same, mm. but you need to be fast to invest in this startup or their competitors that will pop in a year time. You know, I can give you an example if you want. And then the thing is, if you always arrive too late for every of these startups, you, you have a fear of missing out of this specific use case in this industry where the market opportunity is big. I had that with the, the revenue based uh, financing, for instance. Mm -hmm. I, um, I saw Pipe. They were already really big, like they raised, I don't remember, but I think in eight months, they raised like 60 million, like it was crazy. And then I saw uh, Capshays and Capshays, we missed them of really nothing, you know. Then I arrived in France. We were analyzing in Spain a competitor, but meanwhile, we saw one in France. We arrived too late, you know, like I missed maybe like four. It was a super competitive, like you needed mm -hmm. to be all around the place uh, to jump in. And at the end, we managed to invest in, in Bopos in, uh, in, in Spain, you know, but that's a good example. I had the fear of missing out of this specific type of startups that are popping right now. I don't want to miss one. Okay, great, great points. Uh, we'll take one more question. Uh, do you have software development companies as partners? If not, how would you see this possibility to help plug and play startups build their MVPs easily working with such partners? That's a great question. We have a software development uh, team ourselves. 
plug and play okay. because we have a proprietary tool. Uh, our database is far more than a database. It's an innovation management software that actually our partners are using to monitor all of their innovation activities. Um, so, so that's one thing. But on the other side, we tend not to do that because otherwise, you know, the, the, the price that this would cost to the startup or the large corporation may be as high as taking the, 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 the uh, uh, later stage startup. I'll give you an example. Um, mm -hmm. Let's assume there is a, you know, a large corporation that wants to solve one of their problems. Them, they found a startup through us and they are willing to start a, a POC. They know that with the current MVP, they already can do a, a, a POC because otherwise they will not be selecting the startup. Then if you want to make this process faster through a, so, a software development company as a partner, the price will go really up. And so this price difference will actually be equivalent to a later stage startup they could have picked since day one. You know, okay. So I think... Why our corporate partners, when they select early stage startups, is not only linked to the, the, the fees, is because they want also to be able to cobalt something for them, you know, for their specific needs. While when they work with later stage startups, some, most of their products or services are quite standardized and they don't want to be agile, you know, they want the, the volume. While the early stage startup is, they, they just want to, 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 to have a stamp. Right yeah, and to yeah. generate revenue, so they are willing to do whatever the the, the clients is saying. So this agility, uh, I think, is key, and we 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 never done that so far. Um, okay. And I'm I'm not really sure about uh, you know how our corporate partners will react. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Thomas. We are right on the clock right now, so it's one o'clock. Uh, I would like to thank the entire community for being here uh, for this talk and Thomas that you could come from plug and play side and take us through the journey, a very interesting journey of your own of being involved in innovation and your perspective on startup, but at the same time, uh, explaining how this entire huge innovation machinery works at plug and play. So really, uh, really thankful for that. Thank you for being here. And uh, we'll engage later for the Nordic uh, pitch battle and some of the other initiatives that we are taking. And we'll constantly engage with plug and play. You guys are doing amazing stuff. And uh, great to know through Sarah's question that you have big plans for the region. So that's good for all <laughs> the startups. Definitely. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Always great to, to have uh, such chat when they are recorded or not. And, uh, <laughs> you know, keen on learning more about your upcoming events. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure we can do something. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Take good care of yourself. Bye-bye. Take care. Cheers.